Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India Global. We'll get you top stories from India and the region. I am Tanvi Taneja and for news from the rest of the world, I'm joined by my colleague in London, Oli Barrett. Oli, good evening from New Delhi. Hello Tanvi, it's 12.30pm here in London, 1.30 across Central Europe. Coming up in the next half hour, we'll go live to the G7, live to Ukraine and what a letter from Princess Diana might cost you at auction. First, Tanvi's got the headlines. Ukraine's foreign minister asks G7 countries to provide air defence systems as in Israel. Kremlin says... USA to Ukraine won't give them any advantage. One and the only issue on my agenda here at the G7 ministerial is air defense. And uh, for obvious reasons, uh, the role of the United States on the, in the matter of the air defense is fundamental. Israel will decide on how to respond to Iran's attack, says Prime Minister Netanyahu. EU set to impose more sanctions targeting Iran's missile and drone programs. And India prepares for the world's largest general election with the first vote in the seven-phase election to start tomorrow. First news from Europe, G7 foreign ministers will be discussing sanctions on Iran as they meet in Italy's Capri for a key meeting. The continued tensions in West Asia are dominating talks between delegates from the US, the UK, France, Italy, Germany, Canada and Japan. The sanctions are expected to target Iranian drone and missile programs. We are friends of Israel and we support Israel. But we want de-escalation in that area. We all are carriers of this peace initiative. We will also have to address how to sanction Iran in some way for the attack with hundreds of missiles and the drone attack against Israel. The foreign ministers of the group of seven countries cautioned on Thursday that Ukraine would face defeat by Russia if it did not receive additional air defences. The G7 ministers began the second day of talks by discussing the West Asian crisis before turning their attention to Ukraine. Meanwhile, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock expressed optimism about United States' support for Ukraine, something that her government has advocated for a long time. In these turbulent times, it is a hopeful sign that there are now signals from the Republicans in the USA that support for Ukraine can be continued intensively. We have campaigned intensively for this. The Chancellor at the Congress, I, when I was there, as were many, many others time and again. And that is why, including the Minister of Defense and I, have jointly launched this initiative to ask ourselves once again what we can do together to protect Ukraine, but also to protect our European peace order. The G7 meeting in Italy was also attended by Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dimitro Kuleba, who further emphasized the need for additional air defense systems and missiles for Kiev as in Israel. Today I came here mainly to speak about providing Ukraine's, Ukraine with more air defense systems and missiles. And G7 has the capacity to do it. G7 has been making some extraordinary decisions. G7 is interested in defending the world that Ukraine defends uh, uh, against Russian attack. So all we have to do is to, you know, make things happen. On the sidelines of the G7 ministerial meet, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called on supporters of Ukraine to maximize their efforts against Russia as he met with Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba on Thursday. Blinken emphasized the need for the U.S. Congress to pass a bill that would provide $60.84 billion to support Ukraine. Moment. Uh, it is urgent that all of the friends and supporters of Ukraine maximize their efforts to uh, provide with Ukraine with what it needs to continue to effectively defend itself against this Russian aggression for the United States, 
That means passing the supplemental, the extra budget request that the president has made for Ukraine. And to give us the latest from Capri in Italy, we have our correspondent Giles Gibson joining us now. Uh, Giles, Ukraine wants G7 to provide them with air defenses immediately. What is the latest on that? Well, we had some very strong comments from Dmitry Kuleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister who is joining the G7 ministers here on the island of Capri, basically saying that there was a double standard in the way that Western nations deal with Israel compared with Ukraine. So what he said was that there was a strategy with Israel to prevent damage and death, referring there to uh, G7 nations such as the US and the UK who stepped in when Iran fired those missiles and drones towards Israeli territory over the weekend, shooting down uh, those drones and missiles, almost all of them, the US, the UK uh, and other partners. And then he said the strategy when it comes to Ukraine is to help Ukraine to recover from damage that Russia is doing with missile and drone strikes of its own, and then to express sympathy uh, for the death of Ukrainian civilians. So uh, the Ukrainian foreign minister drawing a very clear par parallel there, a very clear contrast between the way that the G7 nations have been responding to drone and missile strikes in Israel versus in his country. And uh, what has been the sentiment at the G7 meet so far to bring peace to both these international crises? Well, what we've seen really is the agenda for this G7 meeting of foreign ministers dominated by recent events in the Middle East. Going into it, what we were expecting was really to see some sort of a, a message, really, a, an urgent plea from the G7 as a united front telling both Israel and Iran to de-escalate tensions and in particular warning either side not to sort of ramp up tensions any further. But what we've seen really in the opening hours, the opening few sessions of this meeting is that there is now this momentum for the G7 to also move forward with some combined sanctions on Iran to respond to those missile and drone strikes on Israeli territory. The U.S. themselves, they are already saying that they are moving forward with some sanctions on Iranian missile and drone programs. Uh, the U.K. are also talking very tough about that. We've seen uh, the European nations at the European Council summit in Brussels also saying that they're going to bring in similar sanctions. So there is this real momentum. I think what's left now over the next 24 hours as this meeting concludes is to get all of the G7 nations onto a completely united front in terms of the exact sanctions that they want to, to, to bring in against Iran. Giles Gibson in Capri, Italy. Thank you for those updates. Speaking to journalists on the sidelines of the G7 foreign ministers meeting in Italy, EU's top diplomat Joseph Borrell stressed that European Union countries must send their anti-missile systems to bolster Ukraine's air defences or risk victory for Putin. We cannot only rely on the U.S. We have to take our responsibility and stop saying, oh, the U.S. will do. We have to do. We have patriots. We have anti-missile systems. We have to take them from the, our, our barracks where they are just in case and to send to Ukraine where the war is raging. And I'm sure we will be doing that, but we have to be done quickly. So like the G7, the European Union too is eyeing new sanctions on Iran after its attack on Israel last weekend. My colleague Oli Barrett is in London. He gives us more on this and other stories making headlines around the world. Oli, the global pressure on Iran continuing. It certainly is, Tanvi. Now, the European Union's sanctions are expected to target Iran's unmanned aerial vehicles and missile programs. EU leaders have urged all sides to refrain from any action that might increase tensions in West Asia.
to condemn this attack launched by Iran against uh, Israel. We have decided to put sanctions, to put in place sanctions against uh, Iran. This is uh, a clear signal uh, that we want to, to send. And we also want to do everything to protect the civilians. Each civilian life matters. Uh, we call uh, on the release uh, without any conditions of all hostages. Uh, we call on a ceasefire, uh, an immediate um, uh, ceasefire. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will make its own decisions on a response to the attack by Iran. Didi India's Sarah Coates reports from Tel Aviv. Certainly is Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister. He is under a lot of pressure. This will be an extremely delicate balancing act for Netanyahu as he on one hand really tries to appease these allies that have shown a lot of support over the last few days, keep them happy and also uh, continue this rare show of international support. I thank our friends for their support in the defense of Israel. And I say this both support in words and support in actions. But I also want to make it clear, we will make our own decisions and the state of Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself. Well, on the other hand, he's facing a lot of pressure from here in Israel domestically, especially uh, from the far right wing elements of his coalition. These are people that also do sit on the Israeli security cabinet. We're talking here uh, the lines of the far right finance minister, Betzalel Smotrich. He's just come out uh, to say that there needs to be a dis proportionate response to these strikes, these uh, missile and drone attacks by Iran, saying that it must rock Tehran. Next to Ukraine and Russia says that Kiev's position on the battlefield is, in, in its words, unfavorable. Moscow claims any additional U.S. military aid for Kiev would not change the status quo. The Kremlin says further military aid would boost the U.S. defense industry, but would leave Ukraine in debt. That came as G7 foreign ministers warned that Ukraine was at risk of losing the conflict unless it received more air defences. Meanwhile, Russia is accusing Ukrainian forces of repeatedly shelling medical facilities with Western weapons in Russian-controlled areas of Ukraine. And we can go live now to Didi India's Megumi Lim, who is in Kiev for us. Megami, Russia accusing uh, Ukraine of repeatedly shelling uh, medical sites and targeting doctors in Russian controlled areas of Ukraine using Western supplied weapons, as we were hearing. What has Kiev's response been to those accusations? Well, Kiev has so far not responded to these accusations made by Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova, who said, as you mentioned, uh, you, uh, she said Ukrainian forces have been targeting medical facilities and medical workers in the four uh, Russian-occupied regions that Moscow claims to have annexed in September uh, 2022. And she said that she had listed out the location and dates of, of where and when these attacks took place and had given uh, this information to the World Health Organization, uh, but that the WHO had not yet taken any action since then. Now she accused Ukraine of using uh, Western supplied weapons to carry out these attacks. And she also accused the, the West of a double standard, saying that the West and Western media have ignored what she called uh, crimes committed by Ukraine. Uh, and she has said that uh, the she, that uh, she will continue to seek a response from Ukraine. Now, these accusations were made a day after Russia launched missiles targeting the northern Ukrainian city of Chernihiv, where at least 17 people were killed and 60 people injured, and a hospital were among the multiple buildings that were destroyed or damaged. And this attack has again prompted President Zelensky to urge Ukraine's Western allies to give more air defense systems to Ukraine. We are seeing more and more Russian missiles and drones breaking through Ukraine's air defense systems as Ukraine is running out of interceptor missiles to shoot these Russian drones and missiles down. Well, Megami, the, the supply of Western weapons has 
dwindled to Ukraine, especially from the United States, with that 60 billion military aid package stuck in Congress for months. But House Speaker Mike Johnson now saying a vote will be held on Saturday for more funding for Ukraine. What is the sentiment on the ground in Kiev? Well, that's why people here in Ukraine are definitely anxious about the upcoming vote. It has been a long wait. President Zelensky and Ukrainian officials have been pressing the United States for months now to get that additional military aid to Ukraine, badly needed military aid for Ukraine. The situation on the front lines has deteriorated in recent weeks, according to Ukrainian Ukraine's top commander, Alexander Sirsky. And we also heard from the Ukrainian army general recently giving a very sobering report about the frontline situation in the east. He said that currently Russian troops outnumbered uh, Ukrainian soldiers seven to ten times uh, on the battlefield in the eastern front lines. Now the situation is dire not only on the front lines but also in Ukrainian cities and regions especially ones bordering Russia. As I mentioned earlier uh, Russia has ramped up its attacks against uh, Ukrainian cities in recent weeks and we are again seeing Russian missiles and drones breaking through uh, Ukrainian air defense systems and US officials have warned that they could not rule out the possibility of the Ukrainian army collapsing uh, without additional military aid as we are expecting Russia to mount a major offensive in the late spring and summer. Okay, Megan, me, thank you. Former U.S. President Donald Trump is due in a Manhattan court later as lawyers continue searching for jurors to decide his fate in an historic criminal trial just months before his rematch with President Joe Biden. Seven jurors have already been selected after two days of grilling by prosecutors and Trump's lawyers. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 felony counts for allegedly falsifying records to cover up hush money paid to an adult actor. The opening arguments are expected to take place on Monday. A letter written by Princess Diana, a portrait of John Lennon, as well as casino plaques from the first James Bond film, Dr. No. They're all among items being offered by the British auctioneer Eubanks in a memorabilia sale next month. Princess Diana wrote the letter to a friend back in January 1996, a month before divorcing her husband then, Prince Charles, who's now, of course, King Charles. And Tanvi, Princess Diana's letter has a price estimate of roughly 800 to 1200 pounds. Also, Ollie, a portrait of John Lennon made by his close friend and former Beatles bandmate Stuart Sutcliffe will also be auctioned at Eubanks in Surrey. So the watercolour painting was hanging in John Lennon's Kenwood home and has a price tag of £3,000 to £5,000. Okay, thank you, Ollie. Ollie Barrett joining us all from London. Still to come on DD India Global. Philippines says the decision to strengthen ties with Japan and the US, a sovereign choice of the country. An Indian woman cadet who was among the 17 Indians on board the ship seized by Iran returns home. Will the Israel-Iran conflict blow up into a full-blown war in West Asia or the Middle East? Who killed the world's largest anaconda barely days after it was first discovered? Watch Connecting the Dots every Friday at 8 p.m. IST or 14.30 GMT on DD India. Thank you for staying with us on DD India Global. I am Tanvi Taneja. 
One of the 17 Indian crew members of the container vessel MSC Ares stuck in Tehran returned to India safely on Thursday. With efforts from both countries, Indian deck cadet and Tessa Joseph from Kerala landed safely at the Cochin International Airport Thursday afternoon. According to the Ministry of External Affairs, the Indian diplomats in Tehran continue to remain in touch with the remaining 16 Indian crew members and are in contact with their family members in India. On this, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar appreciated the Indian Embassy in Iran for safely returning for the safe return of one of crew members to India. The Philippines has said that its decision to ramp up ties with Japan and the United States at a recent trilateral summit was the sovereign choice of the country. It was responding to China's comments opposing the trilateral meeting. The Filipino Foreign Ministry said that the trilateral grouping would promote peace and economic growth in the Indo-Pacific and should not be considered a threat. It said that China's excessive maritime claims and aggressive behavior, on the other hand, are undermining peace and stability in the region. U.S. President Joe Biden hosted the Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida in Washington, D.C. last week, where the three leaders jointly expressed their serious concerns over China's actions in the South China Sea. A Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson had said last week that it opposes forming exclusive circles in the region and any acts that stoke and drive up tensions. And back to India now, where we get you the latest buzz in the run-up to the world's largest democratic elections. So the stage is set for the largest election in the world to take place Tomorrow, this will set the stage for a mammoth exercise in democracy with nearly a billion people eligible to head to the polls across just over six weeks. Polling for the first phase will take place on Friday, that is 19th of April. Voting stations have been set up with training given to officials to ensure a seamless voting experience. Security personnel have also been stationed in all locations for foolproof safety. The seven-phase elections conclude on June the 1st while the counting of votes will take place on June the 4th. So campaigning has intensified for the second phase of elections to India's lower house, scheduled for 26th of April, covering 89 parliamentary constituencies spread across 13 states. India's Home Minister and Senior BJP Leader Amit Shah held a roadshow on Thursday at Sanand in Gujarat's Gandhinagar parliamentary constituency. The BJP workers gathered in large numbers along the route where Amit Shah was campaigning. The leader held another roadshow in Kalul in Gandhinagar. Amit Shah is the BJP candidate from the Gandhinagar seat. He will file his nomination papers on Friday. Voting for all the 26 parliamentary seats in Gujarat will take place in a single phase on May the 7th. In order to garner support in favour of candidates, Congress leader Rahul Gandhi is on a visit to Kerala where he addressed a public gathering in Karnur. While addressing the public, Rahul Gandhi said, Congress and UDF accept the diversity of India. Meanwhile, the Election Commission of India on Thursday issued the notification for the fourth phase of general elections, which will take place on May 13th across nine states and one union territory. This phase will witness polling for 96 parliamentary seats across nine states and one union territory, including Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Odisha, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal and Jammu and Kashmir. According to the poll body's notification, the last date for filing nominations is April 25th. Scrutiny of nomination will take place on April 26th. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi will campaign in Bengaluru on Saturday. Bangalore City has three Lok Sabha seats and this has been a strong fort for the BJP. Will the BJP repeat its performance in its bastion? Opposition leader R. Ashok spoke to DD India on the Prime Minister's visit to the city. 
uh, Mr. R. Ashok, uh, who is the opposition leader and senior uh, BJP leader and also ex-Deputy uh, Chief Minister. Uh, Mr. Ashok, uh, thank you for talking to Doordarshan. Now, the fact that BJP's bastion, the three seats in uh, Bangalore, has always been in the BJP's hold. And uh, you know that uh, this is uh, you know, your strong fort. So how do you see uh, this challenge this time? The Bangalore people normally, they like BJP, they like uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, now they like uh, Modi ji. Uh, the Karna, Bangalore people, especially this time also, they will vote for BJP. And I think uh, out of three, out of three, uh, BJP will win this election. Now, do you see the brand Bangalore is uh, at stake right now? Because in Bangalore, there are a lot of issues uh, we are seeing. Uh, there are issues of uh, law and order. There are issues of water scarcity. So where is the brand Bangalore uh, going now? The law and order situation is very worst in uh, Bangalore. Terrorist activities, gunda activities. There is no water, no water in Bangalore. We have very, very scarcity of the water. Almost all the uh, industries are going out of from ba Bangalore. Uh, I think uh, the failure of the government, the banned Bangalore gone, the terrorist Bangalore is uh, coming. That is the uh, status now uh, in bomb Bangalore. Yeah. There is no brand Bangalore, bomb uh, Bangalore in uh, Karnataka. So what is the advantage BJP has? Is there any anti-incumbency uh, the BJP candidates facing in Bangalore? No, 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 no. They are not voting any individual uh, candidate. They are... Uh, all over Bangalore, they are uh, thinking to vote for Modi. Third time, uh, pr uh, Prime Minister uh, must be Modi. Yes. Aisha Khanam, DD India, Bangalore. So all preparations for the Lok Sabha elections have been completed. The polling officials left for their polling stations with electronic voting machines, EVMs, voter verifiable paper audit trail, that's VVPATs and other items. Over 2,000 polling booths have been made in Nagpur. DD India's Chishu Shailar spoke to the polling officials in Nagpur. Just a few hours left for the polling and we can see that all the arrangements have been put in place here. I'm talking about the Nakhul polling station and behind me you can see a big pendol here wherein the polling officials have been distributing the EVM's machine and the VV pet also. Now these polling officials will receive all those equipments and will reach to their respective polling station by today. They will set up the entire machineries there and will also stay there. Tomorrow morning the polling will start and we will see that people, the voters will come in large number. Well the polling officials uh, have been as I told you them distributed and will travel through. Um, arrangements have been made specially for all these polling officials here. Well, talking about it, uh, as I told you that the special polling booths have been uh, created for women voters. That means all the polling officials who will be working in the polling stations will be women. Uh, Divyang, that is a disabled polling station, have also been created for the disabled people, for the Divyang people also. All the officials will be uh, disabled people will be working there. So these kind of arrangements have been made that we have with us some of the Polling officials, they will ask about the experience, ma'am. Uh, uh, How is the experience over? Have you been voted and what will be your future course of action? Yeah, I have voted and the future course, I can say today only I have voted and tomorrow I will be doing the election duty as a polling officer 3. And then uh, Nagpur district, so of course my vote, that is in compulsory and I should say that every person should vote. And I have voted. Every person yeah. should vote and that's what the officials are saying. Obviously, we also tell to all the people that come in large number to vote and make a democracy strength. Shri Shula for DD India, Nagpur. So after India's poll buzz, we will tell you what all is happening in other parts of the world. In Brazil, state-run energy firm Petrobras is encountering growing resistance from indige indigenous groups and government agencies for its major oil drilling project on the northern coast. Last year, the firm was denied license for drilling in the Amazon area. Scientists studying the Kenyan coast report that 60% of the corals observed off the coast of Mombasa have undergone bleaching. Climate change, compounded by the El Nino phenomena, has led to the unprecedented ocean warming in the past year. And as we wind up, we take you back to London, where a baby rhino, Benja, ran around with his mother at the Whipsnade Zoo outside London. The six-week-old white calf was born on March the 7th, who weighs 100 kg, loves to eat and sleep whenever he's not playing with the other rhinos.
So along with Benja, it's a wrap from me here on this edition of DD India Global. For those of you on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. You can scan the QR code on the screen to download now. Do let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us also on our different social media handles. You can also check out our website, ddindia.co.in. I'm Tanvi Taneja from my entire team in New Delhi. Thank you for watching. Namaskar.